Thank you for being here with us this morning and I uh, want to first of all recognize uh, our Attorney General David Yost for being here and his team. Uh, we're here today with some exciting news about uh, a cold case or a, a case that is 20 plus years old that we've been working on. And uh, we've had some great collaboration and partnership with uh, the Attorney General's office, BCI and I, and their lab, and their folks that uh, do a great job of, this is the second case we've had where they've had been able to do a reconstruction for us. We will continue to collaborate with our forensic partners with the uh, BCI and I and the Attorney General's office to bring to uh, fruition uh, cold cases here in Stark County. Um, these technologies that were not available just a short time ago certainly have helped us in law enforcement to be able to put cases together and continue our investigation. I will tell you that most good police officers will tell you there's nothing better than boots on the ground, people on the ground developing leads. But without this type of help assistance, we would not be able to do our jobs. And so we, we applaud our, our partners and our our, our friends at the Attorney General's office, at BCI and I, for their work that they have done. Also want to thank our, our Stark County Coroner's office uh, and the Coroner Resnick for the work that they have done. Uh, they work with us each and every day. Uh, quite frankly, we are uh, very closely connected to our Coroner's office in the cases that we investigate right here in Stark County, and they're a fantastic resource for us. Uh, we remain committed to pursuing all leads in the in cold cases and I think if you followed our, our agency over the last few years you'll see that we've been very successful in closing some of our cold cases and we'll continue that. Um, we owe it to our victims in our community and I think maybe the general will speak to that uh, in a moment but we owe it to the victims of our community. We owe it to the victims of crime uh, to continue to pursue the closure of these cases and we'll continue that endeavor. I'd like to turn it over now uh, to our Attorney General, Dave Yost, who I consider a friend, known for a number of years, and has always been very uh, responsive to the needs of law enforcement in Stark County and across the state of Ohio. Attorney Yost, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you all for coming today and uh, particularly to the media. Um, getting this word out to the community is important because this young man, somebody loved him. Somebody out there today knows who this young man was. And we need the help of the public to be able to identify him. Everybody deserves to be known. And we need help. I'm really proud of our collaboration with all the law enforcement here in Stark County, but in particular, uh, Sheriff Meyer has uh, been uh, just a wonderful partner on a lot of levels in a lot of cases. Um, and uh, many of you know this, but I want to I, I make a point of saying it every time I, I come out for something like this. Uh, BCI doesn't do law enforcement on its own. We're here as a force multiplier for local law enforcement. We don't have any jurisdiction unless we are invited in by a local chief, uh, a local prosecutor, a local sheriff. Um, and that's the way it should be. Law enforcement should be accountable at the local level. But that being said, there are limitations to what a local office can do. You know, things like DNA labs are very expensive. Uh, talent is rare. You're going to hear uh, for in a moment from a one-of-a-kind talent, um, Sam Molnar. We, we just don't have multiple Sams to go work in every police jurisdiction. Uh, she works uh, at BCI and is able to, mul we're able to multiply her value uh, to the rest uh, of the state. Um, and that's what this case was about. Um, today we're talking about the reconstruction, uh, but in fact, the BCI has been involved at several levels with this. We are, are very proud that in the last few years we've developed the, the capability uh, to do mitochondrial uh, DNA analysis. Uh, I believe we are the only state crime lab in the country and one of only a few, uh, of the other ones are in higher education, that do that. Uh, we 
did a my, mitochondrial extract from the bones of this uh, this John Doe, and we didn't get a hit in any of the databases. So DNA without a match doesn't give you much in the way of identity. Uh, one of the very cool things about this reconstruction is uh, BCI has been able to partner with The Ohio State University, and we have uh, uh, two, two of our uh, academics here today that have been working uh, with us. Uh, we not only are doing a 3D scan and then a, a, a printout of uh, a 3D print of Sam's work, um, but through the software that OSU has, we're able to take care of some things that we don't know the, the what really happened. We don't know what color uh, this person's eyes were. We don't know what his skin complexion was. Um, so by the magic of software, we can look at those variations and say, well, what, what would he look like uh, if, if he had light brown eyes? Um, well, the computer can generate a picture that looks like that, or you know, a darker complexion or a lighter complexion, which may aid uh, also in the uh, identification. Uh, so, really excited uh, uh, about this, and looking forward to good news as the community get, gets a look at this fellow. Uh, he was found just a couple of months after the Twin Towers were struck on 9-11. Uh, if you think back how long ago that seems, that's how long this person has been waiting to be identified. Somebody somewhere knows him. People loved him. We need to have closure here. So. Uh, I would like to introduce, we generally don't put her out in front, but we, uh, I think that in this case uh, you will enjoy hearing a little bit about the wizardry uh, that Samantha Molnar brings to this project. And uh, she's going to talk a little bit about, uh, there's some science involved and there's some art involved and she's the unusual person that is artist and scientist. Sam. Thank you. Um, so my name is Samantha Molnar. I'm a criminal intelligence analyst with the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and I'm also the forensic artist that has done this sculpture, as well as several others over the last few years. Um, basically, the way that I come into a case is if human remains are found somewhere in the state of Ohio, and we can't identify them through uh, fingerprints, if those are still available, dental records, or DNA. And if all of those uh, leads fall short, then the, the case can come to me for facial reconstruction. How we used to do it in the past is we would take the skull to a hospital, we get a CT scan done, and that would generate a 3D image that we could print on a 3D printer. But sometimes the skulls wouldn't print properly or the, the scans were very complex and it would take the printer a really long time to print. So what all the brains at Ohio State that I have had the privilege of working with have done is they've helped to speed up some of these processes. So. What we can actually do now is called photogrammetry. We can take some pictures of the skull and then these amazingly talented people can put it into their software and it'll generate the 3D object. And it's much simpler of a print. Um, if there's any damage to the skull or anything like that, we can uh, digitally repair those things. And then we can print it. It's a simpler print. It takes less time to print. And then for the first time today, we are actually able to do digital renderings as well. So I will complete the facial reconstruction on the, on the 3D copy of the skull. We can still preserve the original evidence. If additional um, items are needed to be submitted for DNA, we can still do that and preserve all of that and then work off this plastic copy. Um, once that's done, then I take a bunch of pictures of my reconstruction. I send it to them and they do the same thing. They generate a 3D rendering of my, um, of my sculpture in their software. And then they can put that into another program where we can change hairstyle, we can add facial hair, we can change skin tone. Um, 
right now it's not something that is publicly available so it's something that we have access to but our goal is to be able to put these out these images out with different hairstyles um, different skin tones different eye colors um, things like that so that's what we've done with this John Doe and actually the previous John Doe that I had worked here in Stark County we created new images for him as well um, sometimes when remains are found they are just skeletal so we don't know a lot of things we don't sometimes hair is not even recovered so this allows us to put images out um, with different hairstyles and different hair colors. Um, the John Doe you see sculpted in front of you today may not be exactly what he looked like in life because there are so many things that we don't know. Um, if he had longer hair, then we can use the software to be able to show that. And then hopefully these multiple images or these multiple versions um, will generate somebody's uh, memory and you know maybe they'll call so the biggest reason why I'm here today is to urge the public to call on your missing loved one if you have a friend or family member that is missing I just urge people to please call your local law enforcement agency please call BCI and report them so even if you don't think it's this John Doe in front of you today if you think they could be a Jane or John Doe somewhere else in Ohio or in the United States just please call and make sure that everything has been done for that case make sure that they have DNA on file make sure that there is an active record that is out there and being worked by the agency so I'm just super excited to be a part of this um, thank you so much Stark County for working with us and thank you Ohio State for everything that you do um, and then I think I'm passing it off to the coroner next Thank you, Samantha. Mr. Burton, representing the coroner's office. Yeah, I'm Dr. Anthony Burton, chief deputy coroner, representing Dr. Russ Neck, the current Stark County coroner. Our office is concerned with determining the cause and manner of death and the identity of the individual. In this particular case, we don't know the identity. Um, we have to rely on the expertise of other departments that are affiliated with us, and I believe that we have a good working relationship both with law enforcement, BCI, and our anthropological colleagues in this case. I'd like to thank all that are involved in our continued pursuit to properly identify our deceased individual. There are many loved ones that appear to have vanished. And please help us identify this individual so that we can bring closure to those who loved and knew this individual. Um, it's important that the community also collaborate with us in this endeavor. And in many cases, they are the final solution. Today, we have the technology to reconstruct the visual identity of the individual, but it takes the community to help us identify this person. Thank you. Uh, I want to take a moment to recognize a couple people that are here with us today. Uh, Joe Morbitzer, who's a friend and the, the director of BCI and I, thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, Samantha, once again, we thank you. This is your second visit to Stark County. You've done fantastic work for us. We appreciate the efforts. General, we appreciate the efforts of your team. Uh, you have a great team, and uh, they really help us along. About 11 years ago, I became the sheriff of Stark County. When I walked through the doors, there was no detective bureau here. It's unimaginable to me that we had no detective bureau. We have 370,000 plus people in this, uh, this county. We needed to put something together. We did. And today is part of the results of us putting something together. Interesting piece about this case, I have my chief deputy who was the officer on scene when we recovered this, this John Doe. And so we're still working it. And that's important for our community to know we have not given up. The other thing is I have Inspector Jones, who's the head of our Detective Bureau and our investigation section, and uh, Sergeant Johnson, who lead our investigators to helping solve crimes like this. And so 
our commitment to the community is we will not give up. We will continue to work. We'll continue to uh, work towards the resolution of this case for victims. To the media, we need your help. Thank you all for being here. You need to put this face out there in the media. You need to put our message out there. We need the help from the community. You can get us that help. We need folks to call us with tips. We need folks to reach out to us if they may know this person or think they know this person. And with that, if it's okay with you guys, I'll open it up to any questions. General, are you okay with that? Okay. Any questions? Yes. Actually, several questions. Uh, for the uh, doctor, uh, please. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is, uh, cause and manner of death, was, was that ever something that you were able to, or your office was able to, to determine with respect to this individual? Well, from the anthropological evaluation, um, it appeared that the individual had a fracture of the clavicle that uh, represented, based on its um, uh, identity and characteristics of the fracture, that uh, it was caused by a projectile, most probably a uh, bullet. The uh, projectile was, of course, not recovered, but from the appearance of the fracture, the expert evaluation anthropologically indicates probably gunshot wound. And another question, please, was uh, uh, given the state of the remains when they were discovered in 2021, can you give us an, a, a guesstimate or an idea of how long you would imagine they had been there when they were discovered? Uh, that's been indeterminate at this point, but um, it it could be a number of years. Yes. Thank you, Doctor uh, Chief. I have a, a question for you. You were on scene when uh, this individual was discovered. Can you tell us the circumstances of the discovery and you know what you found at the scene? It was a uh, piece of property. No home was on it. It was a uh, partially brush covered, wooded up. Um, at the time, I think we were told, we're working with the coroner's office, is that possibly maybe four to six years it had been there in no time, no you know, clear-cut evidence of that. Um, that's about all we had at the time. Sheriff, I have one question for you. Actually, I want to, I want to let everybody else have questions here, too. But, uh, Sheriff, in 2021, there was a similar case where the Attorney General's office helped uh, here create a forensic model um, how did that, what, were you ever able to generate leads uh, or uh, make an arrest with respect to that case? Well, we have not made an arrest, but we have uh, generated some leads and we continue to work on that case. Maybe uh, Inspector Jones could speak to that. Yeah, um, Inspector Jones, shortly after uh, 2001, after the press conference then, uh, we did, we, we worked with uh, Samantha, I know uh, Sergeant Johnson and her uh, had several communications. We had several leads that come in. Uh, every single lead that had, did come in, we followed up on. If DNA was available, we followed those leads. Um, nothing has uh, resulted from that at this point. Uh, although we do, we do continue to follow leads. We get leads every day, and uh, we're continuing to follow up on them. On, on this case, on this case, uh, it was like like the chief said, it was investigated in 2021. Very little information. Uh, bones located in the 2900 block of Trump Avenue uh, could have been there possibly for four to five years. Um, due to technology and some new information that has come out with Ohio State, we have learned some new details uh, that we didn't have years past. So. Um, we're, we're going to start following up a little bit more if we can get an identification. There's really nothing uh, further that can be done at this point with what we have as far as the, uh, the bones are concerned. Um, what we're really hoping for is to generate some leads, identify this person if we can get it, uh, an identification. Then of, course, then, of course, we can find out who his family is, what location he lived in, and then we can uh, work the case from there. But at this point, we're limited on what we can Why this individual? Was there something that prompted the 
building process? Was there something in the case that you wanted to put forth? Well, we had, uh, we had bones at the coroner's office. Uh, we don't have a lot of those cases. Uh, we have several missing persons cases, but where we have some evidence to work with, and, and this is a 20-year case, uh, and working with Sam and uh, Ohio State, the technology is there, so we went forward with this case. Um, there are. Uh, when you start talking missing persons, you, you start talking Stark County, adjacent county, state of Ohio, nationwide. Uh, there, there's multiple missings. We have investigated the missings that are reported thus far. If, if this John Doe was reported, um, we don't know if this John Doe was reported or he wasn't reported. But we are investigating uh, every missing uh, within the state of Ohio. Uh, a relative to that time frame and several years previous, depending on the time frame the bones were there. Can you talk about um, the missing persons cases you may have already explored that didn't pan out or also any dead ends that you still had to investigate? I'm not going to get into all the details of all the cases, but of the missing people or missing persons that have not been recovered, we have investigated. Uh, 99.9% .9 of those. Uh, we have looked at every single one. Before we would come out with an image, we, we can, can uh, cross our T and dot our I's that we have investigated uh, all missing persons and aren't uh, confident to say that we can, we can say there are any of the missing people that we have now. Is that, you understand that? Yeah, so the 3D image is just a 3D image of the skull. So that is just an exact replica of the skeletal remains that are found. And then I just kind of have like a set of, of rules. So I've been to several trainings where I've learned how to do facial reconstruction from a skull. And um, then I just, I kind of have like a book that I follow. So there's different like average tissue depth markers um, for different uh, places in the skull. And then it's also dependent upon like the crime scene report, the anthropology report. So the anthropolo an anthropologist is gonna examine the remains and they're gonna tell me, you know, potential age. I believe he was 21 to 44 years old is what they estimated him. Um, and then um, they're gonna tell me he's male. They're gonna estimate race, things like that. And then I have um, just different guidelines that I follow based upon that information. And on your model, the, the teeth, I mean, that's, there's some missing teeth there that, uh, that may uh, help a, a, a people recognize this individual. Is that exactly representative of what we've discovered? And I don't know, maybe uh, someone else can also say, you know, is that uh, uh, maybe from the uh, coroner's office, but is that a, is that a, um, is that because of uh, just being lost teeth or just the age of the, of the remains? I believe that he had his front teeth. I think that right. they had just fallen out over time okay. from being out in the elements. Yeah, that's, that's okay. so not that unusual. So that, that wouldn't necessarily be something that if someone recognized Right, it, uh, correct. Okay. So I think there was a question asked about why this John Doe and when you look at our when we look at our case files and determining which cases we're going to push to the forefront and try to press on investigating an identification this case was cold we had zero leads on identification we had the ability to, to take what we had what evidence we had share it with Samantha and her team to try to come up with a composite and uh, get this case moving again as I mentioned, we need the public. We need folks to hopefully somebody out there had somebody missing or recognizes somebody that might have been missing. But I think what you're hearing today, these are very complex cases. They're, they're difficult. It's 20 plus years ago. With that in mind, people who may have been related to this individual who, have been, who were his loved ones may be dead. They may be gone. And so as that starts to evaporate, those leads for us evaporate, we take that in consideration when we open up a case. 
a case that's 40 or 50 years old probably would be much harder for us to solve. A case that has an opportunity to where people might still be around that knew this individual are the cases we push to the forefront so that we can identify folks and reopen the case, if you will. The case is always open, but reinitiate the investigation related to the case. Well, absolutely, and you know, our investigators have their own techniques on how they conduct investigations, but in a case like this, we have to go back. We have to come back, we have to find family, friends, relatives, somebody that can identify the person. We confirm that identity through forensics, and then we can work the case from there forward. Uh, so in this case, a lot of cases you start where the case ended and work your way back. This way, we have to, in this case, we have to go back to the beginning. Uh, to the day that this person became missing uh, or turned up missing uh, or was estranged from his family. We, d we don't know any of that information, so we have to go clear back uh, and find that information out so that we can work forward to uh, what eventually caused the demise of this person with the, where they lost their life. Yes. That's correct. In 2001, I believe. Yes. Amanda mentioned the middle grade of uh, 2021 to 44, but the old information we had said that his estimated age was 20 to 26. Yeah. And so based on, again, remember that when we, when we recovered this corpse, it had decayed several years, we believe. And so we were only going on the technology that we had at the time, 20 plus years ago, to try to establish an age. Now, with new technology and folks like Samantha and her team, we're able to do a little bit better job of uh, coming a little closer to the potential age of the, of the victim. Yes. And I see on the poster, you have another John Doe. Do you want to tell us about that one? Yes, we had another John Doe, and um, uh, this person uh, became missing in March of 2020. Uh, and we uh, also utilize uh, the Attorney General's office, office, Samantha, and her team to uh, do a reconstruction on that as well. And so that's what you're seeing um, as a result of that. And I think uh, Inspector Jones mentioned that we did, after that case, ref uh, ref get a few referrals on leads. Uh, we continue, to, that case is still open, uh, and we continue from time to time to get leads on that. But today's a good time to get that information back out into the community. Uh, we're still working that case, and we certainly would, could use some help from the community. Can you give us any facts on that one, like approximate age, birth to the uh, Yes, not bad. Yeah. I don't have all the details on that case. I know we did the release on that a couple of years ago. Um, same, similar situation, bones located near an oil well. Um, we recovered them. Again, the, the details are very minute when you're getting into no identity. When we, can't, when we don't have any identity, uh, really the only thing we know is what we have when we respond to that location of where the bones are at. So um, there was a, a release on that. Like I said, I think we followed up on 30-some leads on that case. Uh, every single one was, um, was checked on and it remains, it remains where it's at. So any help on that case, like uh, Sheriff Meyer said, would be, would be uh, uh, helpful. Was there any known cause of death on that case? Or was it no cause of death on that case. I think uh, at this time I'll ask the general if you have any closing remarks. Uh, appreciate you taking the time out to be with us today. I know you have a busy schedule. A reminder that we had a 40-second video that I was supposed to play oh. and we did. Well, let's do that. Well, can uh, we do is that? that? still doable? Yes. Jordan, are we good? <coughs> yes. We'll make that happen. Today, BCI has a new way to bring these models to life. Through a partnership with Ohio State, we're using cutting-edge photogrammetry to upload scans of a skull to render a digital 3D model. From there, we can change factors unknown to investigators like skin tone, eye color, facial hair, and hairstyle. 
We could also do an age progression cases where investigators don't have a precise age for the remains. Our hope with this new technology is to give law enforcement and the public alternative images of unidentified persons to generate more leads, expand the possibilities of solving the case. You OSU guys, don't age my face anymore. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, General. You. Thank you all for being here. This concludes our press conference today, and uh, we appreciate any help you can give us by getting this information out to the communities, uh, surrounding communities throughout Northeast Ohio, so that uh, hopefully we can generate uh, some leads in this case. Thank you so much for being here.